violates Xi's major taboo, story inside Evergrande chairman's arrest revealed. Xi Jinping abandoned his political reform commitments upon coming to power, leading him into danger. Chinese provinces may go bankrupt. Police officers in first-class cities also had salaries cut. A businessman posted a video on WeChat, accusing Evergrande chairman Xu Jiayin of avoiding his responsibilities. He also pointed out that Xu's arrest was because he violated the Chinese president's major taboo. Evergrande Group announced on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange on September 28th that Xu Jiayin, also known as Hui Kaiyan in Cantonese, was suspected of violating the law and various crimes and has been put under police surveillance. His second son and several senior managers were also taken away for investigation by police. Wang Hongsheng, founder of the television manufacturer Skyworth, released a video on October 2nd revealing the inside story of Xu's arrest. Wang said, It is despicable that Hui has chosen to be the enemy of the Chinese people by applying for the bankruptcy protection in the U.S. so he can leverage the confrontation between China and the U.S. and hide his wealth. He dumped debts in China and kept assets in the United States. According to Wang, Xu transferred assets overseas by issuing bonds, which his family members then bought. They then become their personal assets in the U.S. Protecting these American assets means the debt is thrown to China, and all the assets are under American names. According to Wang, the Chinese regime had given Xu special protection when Evergrande was in crisis in 2021. All of the lawsuits against the property developer were rejected in many provinces and could only be handled in the Guangdong Provincial High Court. It was obvious that Chinese authorities had given Xu protection so that he would have time to solve various disputes. Wang tried to explain why the government recently moved to take criminal detention against Xu. Xu committed a major taboo when he filed for U.S. bankruptcy protection. The measure shields non-American companies undergoing restructurings from attempts by creditors to sue them or freeze their assets. Wang also linked the bankruptcy protection filing to Xu's recent divorce, as well as his ex-wife and first son's migration to America. Wang's video, published on October 2nd, quickly became one of the top trending items on the platform, attracting more than 100,000 views by early evening. Evergrande now has more than $300 billion in liabilities, making it the poster child of a debt crisis in China's real estate industry, which contributes to roughly a quarter of the economy. Recently, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, Xi Jinping, has faced domestic and international difficulties, drawing significant attention. An insider revealed to the Epoch Times that Xi Jinping expressed his views on political reform before assuming power. However, later, he agreed with the conservative faction to seek re-election, shifting towards the right wing, which put him in a dangerous situation. Analysts suggest that Xi Jinping came to power by negotiating agreements with conservative and reformist factions, achieving significant progress in anti-corruption efforts. However, as a second-generation Red Party prince wanting to protect the party, he increasingly leaned towards cracking down on corruption, which led him into internal conflicts. Xi Jinping's family has a tradition of faith and belief in Buddhism. Wu Zuolai, a scholar living in the United States and a former director of the Chinese Academy of Arts Research Office, recently revealed to Epoch Times that Xi Jinping's family tends to believe in the traditions of Buddhism. Before Xi Jinping came to power, a group of cultural conservatives persuaded him to return to tradition, because the Chinese Communist Party could not gain the trust of the Chinese people by relying solely on Marxism. No one would believe in the Marxist doctrine of the CCP daily, Wu Zuolai said. Xi Jinping agreed. Yes, that's right. This traditional culture is outstanding. I will attach great importance to it after taking office. After coming to power in 2012, Xi Jinping visited Chu Fu, the hometown of Confucius, in November 2013, to inspect it and promote traditional culture. In September 2014, he delivered a speech at the 2565th anniversary of Confucius's birth and spoke at the Global Confucius Conference in 2017. He warned political and legal officials 
There is a god three feet above your head, so you must be in awe, and more. A professor who is close to Xi stated that he believes in the supernatural power of Buddhism. In conversations, he showed a keen interest in Buddhist martial arts, Qigong, and other mystical powers that could benefit health. He seemed genuinely convinced by these supernatural forces. Xi Jinping once promised political reforms. Wu Zuolai also said, As far as I know, more than 10 years ago, many people said that Xi Jinping criticized the Chinese Communist Party in both discreet and open ways. Later, he and his family had good relations with reform-minded people. His mother had a very good relationship with Hu Jintao and Zhao Ziyang's family. Xi Jinping also promised and expressed his intention to implement political reforms, so reformists were pleased then. Xi also promised to rectify the June 4th incident. Epoch Times journalist Wang He analyzed with reporters, Xi Jinping did indeed make these positive statements. But for Xi Jinping at the time, this was also to gain power. In 2012, fierce struggles among factions in China took place. Former Premier Wen Jiabao called for political reform. After exposing the CCP's organ harvesting atrocities, Wen Jiabao opposed Zhou Yongkang in the Politburo. Wang He said, Xi Jinping's ruling philosophy at the time included positive elements, namely promoting China's democratic political system. However, Jiang Zemin and his faction saw that Xi Jinping was different from them. So they wanted to promote Bo Xi Lai, and a political power struggle ensued between the two sides. In this process, Xi Jinping joined forces with Hu Jintao, and after coming to power, he launched a purge against the entire Jiang faction. The turning point when Xi Jinping shifted to the right wing. Wang also analyzed that Xi Jinping was particularly committed to protecting the party, which the conservative faction exploited especially when Xi Jinping met Wang Huning and dragged him into the conflict. At the 19th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping wanted to amend the constitution first to achieve lifelong rule, but this was a trap set for him from the beginning. Jiang Zemin had a plot to deceive and reached an agreement that spoiled two events. One was arranging for Jiang's faction member Ma Zi to be close to Xi, and the other was making Xi constantly take root in Jiang's faction. Wu Zuolai said that Wang Qishan, who helped him fight corruption, told him about the old system and the Great Revolution. In other words, a major revolution will likely occur during the transition from the old system. So Xi Jinping must have been very worried and fearful. Wang He said, So some promises and positive expressions made by Xi Jinping in the past were ignored or discarded by Xi leading to the extremely dire situation we see today. Wu Zuolai also said, Xi Jinping clings to the Chinese Communist Party and has defeated all reformist forces, but the Chinese Communist Party is already stuck. The Chinese Communist Party has accumulated too much public resentment and hatred. Once it suddenly erupts and the military rebels, defects, or even fights, if the CCP attacks Taiwan when tensions are at their peak, then by that time, it will be in a situation similar to the Qing dynasty and the Yuan dynasty. The people will truly rise and kill them. So for Xi Jinping, political institutional reform is vital. It brings hope to the people and helps himself, his family, and the CCP internally avoid revenge when the CCP suddenly collapses. China has entered the Comprehensive Salary Cuts era and the finances of the country's local authorities are in major crisis, in which 12 provinces and cities are at high risk of bankruptcy. Bloomberg reported that Beijing is launching a trillion-dollar bond plan to solve local authorities' debt problems. According to RFA, many Chinese regime workers revealed that civil servants in Jiangsu, Tianjin, Guangdong, and other major economic provinces are owed salaries due to financial exhaustion. More than 18,000 Tianjin Municipal Government and Tianjin Rail Transit Group employees have been owed salaries for several months. Sources revealed that Tianjin is essentially financially bankrupt. Its debt far exceeds production value. The only option is to increase taxes, which makes businesses unable to bear the burden. In Nanjing, the capital of Jiangsu Province, a significant economic province with the country's second largest GDP last year, 
civil servants and public institutions in several districts have not been paid for several months. Local authorities had to borrow money across districts to solve the problem partially. Some scholars analyze that the Nanjing city government is facing the risk of bankruptcy. Guangdong province is also experiencing a significant financial crisis. Retirees' salaries have been reduced significantly, and retired teachers have had their wages cut by half. It shows that the financial balance of China's two strongest economic provinces, with GDPs exceeding 10 trillion yuan, is out of balance. It doesn't stop there. Chinese media person Zhao Lantian wrote on September 29th that the crisis is increasing. The entire Yunnan province has stopped paying salaries. Officials at all levels have tried to exploit normal people. As far as she knew, a retired Tianjin teacher named Jian revealed that the police in Tianjin, Nanjing, Dalian, and other places have had their salaries cut by 20%. Systematic salary cuts happen nationwide, but the level is different in places. Some scholars said that once the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, cannot afford to pay for military and police operations, it will collapse. Last year, political and economic observers also proposed a term called post-CCP China, when every administrative unit of the CCP has a financial deficit and the central government has no money to compensate. If the situation lasts for 24 months, China will enter the post-CCP era. With their finances in crisis, China's local authorities have tried every way to generate revenue. On September 23rd, a video went viral in China online. A pedestrian street in Fuzhou City, Jiangxi Province, publicly blocked pedestrians to charge a toll for people to walk. A man recorded the scene on his phone and scolded the toll collector. There is no pandemic and no traffic accident. Why are you blocking the road here? Some netizens agreed. What era is this? Even walking has to be paid. They're so poor that they've become crazy. The government couldn't pay salaries, so they planned to block roads and rob people. On September 28th, Bloomberg reported that the Chinese regime began implementing a plan to allow local governments to reissue bonds and use new debt to pay off old debt. An official document shows that Inner Mongolia will issue three refinancing bonds worth more than $9.1 billion with a three- to seven-year term. The bond will repay the principal once and pay the final interest upon maturity. After issuance, it can be circulated on the national bank bond market and stock exchange. According to Bloomberg, Chinese authorities have identified 12 provinces and cities as high-risk areas, such as Guizhou, Hunan, Jilin, Anhui, and Tianjin, and said these areas would receive more support. Beijing will allow provincial authorities to mobilize about $140 billion, or 1 trillion yuan, through bond issuance to pay off local government financing facilities and other state debts. Official data from the regime showed that from January to August, total local government bond issuance reached $874 billion. As of November last year, the total outstanding debt of China's local authorities nationwide was $10.8 trillion.